What I want us to consider is the question of whether the Old Testament supports violence. We can make a pretty clear case against the Bible. The Bible reports how God commands Israel to destroy nations, including non-combatants, people not fighting, including children. We could argue it's always immoral to kill innocent people, but this is incompatible with God being a God of love and isn't it just like all sorts of other religious and racial violence we condemn in the world today? Who of you feels the force of that objection? We got a few people, that's good. Well, I'd like to make 15 points, but the problem is I don't really have the time. So I'm going to just use a story. Uh, many of you will know the story of Harry Potter. And in this story, there is a wonderful wizard called Albus Dum Dumbledore. And he is a kind person. And yet there is a journalist who thinks that he is not kind. She, Rita Skeeter, thinks that he is a very mean person because he is setting up Harry uh, to be killed. He is simply using him. What is more, she has evidence. She can report specific things that he has done that look very suspicious. And what we find uh, in that story that's w well worth reading is that you have a hermeneutic of a suspicion applied to a character and you can make them look really bad. If you do the same with the Old Testament, it might make it look like God is really bad. Well, another illustration could be this. Look at this game. I don't know how many of you ever played this game, let me out. You're trying to get the gold piece out through this gate here. But that means the gray piece needs to go up here, but that gray piece needs to go across, which means that gray piece needs to go down, and so on. Often our society makes objections and it expects a one-line answer. And we can't give a one-line answer any more than there is a one-move solution to this. We need to move around various things because often our society has made definitions that mean that we have to uh, question those definitions before we can even answer. So there are two things that we need to think about. One is a simple story. Are people treating the character fairly? And another thing would be, if I'm really going to answer this question, I need time to be able to move around several pieces that are in place in your mind. Well, let's have a try at 15 of those. Firstly, we sometimes accept people who plan to take innocent life as heroes. How would I illustrate that? On the terrible days of the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, in New York and uh, uh, elsewhere, you remember that there were these four terrorist planes. But there were also two F-16s that were scrambled uh, by uh, the US authorities in response. And they were given the instruction to try and bring down the remaining plane that hadn't yet hit a building. They were actually unarmed at the time. And so the two pilots, Mark Sassville and Heather Penny, came up with a plan that the only way they could do that would be if they were to fly their F-16s into the front and the back of United uh, Airlines Flight 93. Now, they didn't actually reach that uh, aeroplane. It was brought down by other means. But the point is, they were good people who woke up in the morning wanting to do a professional job, and they were willing to do something which would have taken innocent life and have lost their own life. Does that mean that they were mean? Well. When they came back down to earth, uh, to land, there, there was no criticism of them. In fact, I believe they were heroic. They were wanting to save life. But, of course, it would have involved taking innocent life. Another illustration could be uh, the Norwegian commandos who sank that boat uh, on the lake which was carrying um, heavy water which Hitler wanted to make into a highly potent bomb. But, of course, they could not learn they could not teach, um, instruct the locals that they were going to do this, and some innocent people were killed. But if one of those was your grandfather, you would not be ashamed. There are these extreme situations. But that's just one piece to, to remember, that just because someone has planned to take innocent life does not mean that they are a nasty person. Second factor, God is the giver of life. Uh, he, in fact... Um, uh, has given all life, that means arguably he's the owner of life. Now you should not take a life just because someone tells you to. So if in that concentration camp the Nazi guard tells you to take the life of your fellow, you say no. Why? 
because that Nazi guard has no moral authority to do so. But sometimes it's possible for permission to change a moral category. I could give you the keys to my car and say you may take my car, and then when you take my car, it is not stealing. However, if you take my car without my permission, it is stealing. Now, God is the only one who can authorize us to take life. And what I want to say is that we should define murder as the unauthorized taking of life. Thirdly, God has future knowledge and that changes things. Imagine if you knew everything about the future, what uh, you might do which you would not do otherwise. For instance, if you were uh, two cars passing, uh, one could go past the other uh, on a blind summit, the top of a hill, uh, if they knew that there was nothing coming on the other side. There are all sorts of things that we not, might do. Now, God has future knowledge, and we might think, well, ga gambling in a casino would be a very bad idea. It would be irresponsible, but if you had future knowledge, it would not be so irresponsible. It would just be cruel to the other people. <clears throat> now, many people, when they say that uh, you shouldn't judge the morality of something by the consequences, do that because when you work that out with humans who don't know the future, you get to ridiculous results. I would simply say when you work it out with an omniscient being, it isn't so bad. I'm not saying God is a consequentialist, I'm just saying it is something to be considered. Now, we consider the F-16 pilots, or those Norwegian commandos, as heroes despite two moral vulnerabilities. One is the question of did they have the authority to take life? The Norwegian commandos did not own the lives they took. The F-16 pilots did not own the lives they planned uh, to take actions which would have led to um, those people dying. Moreover, they also did not know the future. The Norwegian commandos did not know whether um, Hitler's plan of heavy water would have any success. The F-16 pilots did not know that there was going to be necessarily any damage brought about by that plane. Perhaps the good people would have got back control, and so on. So if we're prepared to accept them as heroes despite those two moral vulnerabilities, we can make an a fortiori argument, an argument from the weaker to the, uh, the stronger to the weaker, that in this situation, if we're prepared to accept this despite the weaknesses, well, what we find is that in the situation of God, those weaknesses don't exist. So what we could say is, at least that gives us a position for God to be an all-loving, all-knowing God, uh, and nevertheless plan to take innocent life. But I'd want to say there's a further thing. There is lots and lots of other evidence of God's benevolence. Whenever you're dealing with judging a character, you need to look at this. And this is a very big argument because we could put under this the evidence of God's benevolence from sending his son to die on the cross. This is a very, very big one, but I'm only touching on it briefly. Fifthly, these are miraculous narratives, and those have different ethical rules. When people critique the Bible, often what they do is they launch two critiques at once. One is to say it's not true historically. Secondly, it's not fair. I want to say when you are critiquing a story, it is not right to launch those two critiques together because the question of whether it's true historically is irrelevant to the question of whether it's fair or not. Now, when I read The Lord of the Rings, I may not believe that hobbits really exist, but for the sake of judging the story, I have to believe in hobbits, I have to believe in the ring. Uh, when I am looking at Harry Potter, I have to believe that wizards really exist. Now, if I'm an atheist reading the Bible, I have to believe in the miraculous God of the Bible for the sake of the story, because he is the biggest character in the story. I can no more read the Bible and say, uh, factor God out of the story, than I can read Homer's Odyssey and remove Athena from the story. She's big in the story. She, you know, so you've got to think of that. So if I'm going to judge the morality of these stories, I have to factor in the reality of God and the reality of the miracles. Don't get rid of those. Now, I would allow my children when they're a bit younger to watch the Tom and Jerry stories. Why would I do that? Because I recognize that my children had enough intelligence to recognize that different physical laws apply in the Tom and Jerry universe. Uh, they may do one thing to another and then it will be reversed. And therefore, I judged that my children could discern that if they did the same to each other, they would not have the same results. 
You can have a story like The Sorcerer's Apprentice, where, of course, you chop uh, a broom in two, and it becomes two brooms. Now, one of the reasons why uh, we believe it's a bad idea to stab someone is it tends to uh, shorten their life and tends to give them pain. Imagine a world in which stabbing someone lengthened their life and gave them pleasure. Well, probably you'd have different laws about stabbing people. Now, when people read the Bible as secularists, they look at the story in Genesis 22 of Abraham offering up his son Isaac, and they read it like this. The only thing that Isaac has is his life. And here is Abraham about to take the only thing that he has. Whereas the story in the Bible is a miraculous story. Abraham has already had God actually appear to him, and he's had this son remarkably. And God, who has shown himself to be faithful, has given promises that through Isaac, Abraham is going to have many, many offspring. Therefore, Abraham knows that whatever he does plunging the knife, Isaac has to continue to exist in order to have those offspring. So we don't have to read the book of Hebrews to know that Abraham believed that he could be raised from the dead. Now, in miraculous narratives, different things apply. So when people look at the story of the Exodus and conquest, they forget that it is the biggest display of signs and wonders of miracles in the entire Old Testament, that God is the main character, and you cannot remove him from that. So we have to recognize that this is not a parallel with modern wars that might go on uh, uh, with genocide in Rwanda or something like that. It is something completely different. In fact, according to the story, God did most of the fighting. Um, seventhly, we do not know that the Canaanite children were worse off dead. In secularism, when someone dies, that's usually it. Whereas for Christians, the fate of children, uh, of believers or of unbelievers, is not something which is um, explicit um, within Scripture. But there is a presupposition sometimes that people make that the children were worse off dead. The command was given with lots of objective evidence. One of the best attested events on the planet was uh, the supposed wedding of William and Kate. I say supposed wedding because how many people actually saw it? Well, the number of people within the church was only a few thousand, and of those, only a few hundred would have been close enough to see things. And that means that although it was watched by many, many people on screens, it was not attested by that many people. On the other hand, according to the Bible story, 603,550 men, just men alone, were under the mountain when God boomed the Ten Commandments in a loud voice. So in terms of the amount of attestation that we have for these words, I would say they are the best attested words that have ever been heard. No one has ever heard someone's voice unamplified, that, that many people actually hear uh, a voice like this. This is one of the most attested events in the entire history of the globe. The idea that God was speaking was not an idea in someone's head. Like, like that man uh, recently in Times Square who thought he heard voices. It's not a subjective thing. This is objective, given with more objective evidence than almost anything you believe has happened. There are all sorts of things you believe to be true historically that have far less evidence. Moreover, according to the story, the Canaanites were wicked. In fact, they were sacrificing their own children, uh, according to the story. And so... Uh, uh, that certainly put an end to child sacrifice. We might argue that there was no reasonable alternative. If you say, no, God should have killed the adults and left the children, but God, um, uh, who knows everything, might know that in doing that, those children would avenge their parents and that would lead to a cycle of violence which would last for 371 years and, and kill this many people and cause this much suffering, all sorts of things like that. We assume that there must have been a better way, uh, whereas uh, the Bible teaches us that, in fact, total justice only comes at the end of time, that it's not possible um, to um, judge the world in a total way um, before the end. Moreover, eleventhly, 
Israel was in a unique position as God's judicial representative. That's not a position paralleled uh, today. Um, a judge can command someone to be put in prison. Uh, someone working for the police may uh, be authorized to hold someone and put them in prison. Israel was not doing something on its own behalf. It was given something it was commanded to. Twelfthly, the Canaanites were warned and able to repent. In fact, it's quite striking that Rahab claims this. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. In other words, all of the people that she's associated with have heard of the amazing miracle with the Red Sea. And then she says, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. Well, if Rahab has seen enough evidence to conclude who God is, and she's seen the same evidence as the other people, surely they could also have concluded the same. There is another passage, three chapters later, where it says this, As soon as the kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites, who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel, until they crossed over, their hearts melted, and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Notice this, God dried up two lots of water and they heard about both, the Red Sea and the Jordan. God likes two or three witnesses. He gave them these huge miracles that they all knew about and what did the kings decide to do? They decided to shut their gates. Well look, if a prostitute can decide she'll open her home, why can't the, king, why can't the kings decide they're going to open their cities? but they did not. They decided to fight. Or again, the story of the Gibeonites tells about how this uh, group heard of the amazing things that God had done. So what if God, what God did brought an end to Canaanite child sacrifice and maybe over time brought about the death of fewer children? I want to argue also that the usual atrocities were absent. If you were being surrounded by the Assyrians, you were worried not just that they might kill you, but what they might do with you before they killed you. But in fact, we find that is absent from the narrative in Joshua. Also in the Bible, no one is absolutely innocent. And if you're worried that these are stories which promote violence, you couldn't imitate these stories. If you tried, you can't do the miracles. Now, if you want to make an objection, an objection can't be, why did God? Why did God is just a question. And there are, there's an infinite number of unanswered why did God questions. Because if God is infinite, why should I expect to be able to understand him? So let's say our understanding is 0.1% of God's. Well, that's, that's an overstatement. Well, how much would of God, what God does would we expect to understand? Not very much. And what we're saying is God is infinite. So how much of what God does do you expect to understand? Uh, so. Uh, an objection actually needs to be a statement, and here are some possible objections. One, it was immoral to God to command, for God to command the destruction of the Canaanites. Do you want to defend that statement? Or you could argue it's immoral for the Israelites to obey such a command if it really was given the way the Bible describes. See, those are, to me, the, the only um, two objections that can be made to the narrative. Which one of these two objections are you wanting to make? You can make a third objection, which is that reading the Bible causes people to be violent. But for a society which has lots of um, violent um, gaming programs and lots of violent videos, if they do want to make this objection, they need to do the sociological study to prove empirically that reading the Bible makes people violent. All I can say is that Bella Vista Prison in Colombia was a very violent prison before the Christian revival there and became a very unviolent prison afterwards. I don't think the same effect would be had by reading secular literature. And then finally, uh, someone might argue that the writing of the stories itself was propagandistic and distorted history, and that was immoral. But apart from those four objections, I can't think that there are any objections that could be made, and I believe that none of them are sound. The top objection, it was immoral for God to command the destruction of the Canaanites, really just seeks to read God's character in a cynical way. 
When you take into account all of the signs of his benevolence and all of the things that may have been known to him and not to us, it is perfectly credible that he, as a loving God, commanded what he did for good reasons which may be known to us or may not be known to us. Thank you.